Okay, and welcome to show 11. Hi, is that right? can I ask a favour first? Yeah. It is show 11. Can you like shave the top of here, please? Yeah, I've got a little baldy bit. You've got like a line and I keep staring at it and it's just in my way. And Well, I've kept it since the last show and I see you started going yours as well. Growing. So that's quite nice. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, talking about beards. Yes. We've got a real beard. We've got a man's beard. Puts on the, you to shame. Uh, it, it does on the sofa. So our guests today, um, Ian Matthews from Kasabian. Hello. Um, a Keith who's from British Drum Company and has long heritage oh. of in the British Drum Companies, um, which we talk about. And we've got our token Australian, haven't we? Yeah. I thought I was the token Australian. No, not with a beard. No, no, He's got a bigger beard than you. So so we've got Mickey Sorbello here from yes. the Gravel Tone. So, um, do you like the t-shirt? That's beautiful. And you wear it so well. I, I wore it just for you today. Mm. Oh, I like it. And yeah, so uh, I thought uh, a special treat, I'd wear this. So, <laughs> so anyway, guys, thanks, uh, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, are you nervous? Yes. No. no. <laughs> 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 So, let's start. Ian. Um, so, uh, Kasabian, of, uh, apart from celebrating Leicester winning the uh, championship for the American viewers, that's soccer we're talking about here. Yes. Um, the Premiership. You, the yes. Premiership. Yeah, you've, uh, the band have been hiding, hibernating. What, yeah. What's happening? Well, we toured so much. I mean, we started touring in 2004 when we f bought the first album out. And it's been pretty kind of intense, really, since then. And um, we decided to have some time off, um, give everyone a break, and then give Serge more time to like figure out the sixth record, which we're on now. And, um, and kind of, you know, being at that position, you know, 12 years down the line, you know, maybe, yeah, it was time to take the, the foot off the gas a little bit and just refresh everybody, everybody's headspace, you know, us, the people who are into the band and everything. Um, and um, yeah, it's been good. In, you know, as you'll get onto later, you know, it's given me opportunity to do other things. Um, my good friend Keith here has got me involved with the British Drum Company, so I've had time to, you know, to be with. Are you still good friends, even though you're yeah. working with now? Is that sort of <laughs> <laughs> slowed down a bit now? <laughs> I love him. He's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> but you did a big concert this year. Um, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, it's. Um, because the last gig we did was last August, uh, um, we did V Festival, yeah. and then we did a couple of European festivals, Rock in Sen, and I forget the other one, it was in Switzerland. And then that was kind of down to all, really. Um, and it was great because obviously the Leicester team, against all odds, were throttling their way through the, the Premiership. Yeah. And um, they did it. And a few weeks before that, Serge rang me and was like, there's a definite change of atmosphere in the city. Because we've just been down to the, down to the football ground, watch the game, and he goes, the, the place is electric. And he goes, you know, I think they're going to do it. So we're going to ask the, 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 you know, the, the football team, if they do, can, can we maybe, uh, you know, get involved with the, the victory parade? Yeah, yeah. And would they consider, which I've never done before, putting on a night of us doing a show at the, the King Power Stadium. Yeah, I've never done it before, um, partly due to the, the construction of the stadium. The, a lot of the terracing is just kind of metal girders and it shakes enough during a game, <laughs> <laughs> let alone having a, a gig on. And so we had to blank out a load of the seating um, because the council would never allow people to be up there. But um, they agreed. And um, so, yeah, the whole of month of May was just mayhem, literally mayhem. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Goodable. <laughs> <laughs> These are the jokes, folks. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get any better than this. Yeah. I'll, I'll be off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's why I play the drums, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it, yeah, it's so literally, you know, threw the band back together again. And, you know, a lot of the crew were obviously working with other people, but we managed to get a lot of our, our family back together. Literally, the, 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 the stadium show was the notice for that six weeks so i think our crew and our management are in the guinness book of records for turning around a stadium show because these things take months and months and actually the the show i think sold out in like four minutes so we put a second night on so we did the we did some rehearsals and then we did three songs on the the main stage in victoria park which is the main park in the middle of leicester and um, we played, well, the, t the team came on and did the whole lifting of the cup, a few, you know, heartfelt speeches. And then we went on to a crowd of 150,000, which was insane, really. 
Um, and then we did some more rehearsals, production rehearsals, some warm-up gigs, and then, yeah, we hit two nights at the King Power come the end of the month. Wow. And it was nice to be like, wow, you know, we're still, we're still in the band, you yeah. know, because it's been yeah. so long since we last, you know, I live in Bristol, the boys live in Leicester, so I don't really see them a great deal, you know. Yeah, well, there's no chance of you doing uh, one of these concerts for Bristol Football Club anyway, so <laughs> you'll be fine. That'd be, well, uh, we'll you see, know. eh? <laughs> <laughs> I see. They've just extended the stadium, so... Uh, well, you know. ready, just in case they win the... Uh... <laughs> But um, yeah, so um, other, otherwise, you know, it's been, you know, we've, we've done some work on the album over the months and um, I know you were going to ask me about this, but, you know, there's some bits and pieces happening. You know, one of the tracks off the album, Come Back Kid, is going to be featured on the next FIFA, FIFA 17, mm -hmm. which, is, which is amazing for us. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we'll see, really. We're not in a rush, you know, it's... Is the album being written or is it being Pretty recorded? Pretty much. I, mean, I spoke to Serge the other day and he's still got some ideas up his sleeve. Okay. Um, now we've sort of, now we've kind of got a body of the, the work together and it's like, right, he's talking in terms of maybe having a few more ideas. Right. So, um, so yeah. See like, what listen, happens. See what happens. It's a nice place to be, you know. I mean, you know, in any band, the first into the second album, I learnt the word sophomore right. in 2006. What the hell is this sophomore? Yeah. It's your second album, yeah. you know. Which is technically harder than the first, you know, on paper. But we managed to survive that, get through that, and then obviously West Rider came out, which took the band on to a different level. Um, but that was pretty much bang, bang, bang. You know, then a little bit of time off, and then we, we then Velociraptor, then into Forty Eight Thirteen, and then now it's okay. It's time to sort of chill so the next album is going to be called Leicester Football Club won the Premiership yeah. is that correct <laughs> that'd be a good name it? and it'll be the picture will be of the boys holding up the cup themselves <laughs> don't give them ideas right <laughs> over to you um, so I actually have a question for Keith in that uh, Bruce Drum Company has been going for nearly a year now because you launched at the London Drum Show yeah. last year um, I wanted to know how that came about particularly with you and Ian obviously not having me and Ian, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. you're like, there's a lot I could say on that. <laughs> I'll give you the PG version. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, I met Ian at the Scottish Drum Fair 2014, 13, was it? I think so. Um, yeah, and uh, basically, I was working for Premier Drums at the time, I was displaying the drums up at the Scottish Drum Show, and it just so happens me and Ian were staying in the same hotel. And then um, we, we had a drink, um, then we had another. <laughs> and then yeah, six, half past six in the morning. Half yeah. <laughs> past six in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> 24 hour bars, um, I mean, that's Scotland, you know. Yes, I mean, yes, yeah. I've got to give it to them, you know, thanks for that, because <laughs> that night, you know, we, there was a con conception, wasn't mm. there, that night? And, <laughs> yeah. And then. Well, no, not literally. <laughs> 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 I thought we were going PG. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more sitting here thinking that's the PG version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and then we got talking, and um, and since then we we made friends. And whenever he came to Manchester, he would um, stay at my house, but not like that. <laughs> and then um, and we just got talking about drums. We we like the same sort of style of drums, same kind of bands and everything. And um, I was always trying to get him to come over to the band I was working with at the time, but then but that um, kind of fell up fell apart. We, um, you don't want to give us any dirt on that then? No, I don't want to give you any dirt on that, no. <laughs> but basically, that came to an end, and I, Ian invited me to his V Festival, his last show. I didn't get invited. And, uh, That's because so you're not special. Okay, sorry. You know. <laughs> 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 and I, uh, so I went, I went there. I had in my mind, I was going to ask Ian to join the British Drum Company, not just as an artist, but as kind of like a partner, as like an ambassador for the company. And I know that after the show, the last thing you want is someone do you know what I mean? Oh. Slavering down your, your ear, as you like. So I thought, I, I won't say anything to Ian. I'll, I'll wait his, I'll wait to his back home and, and he's settled down. Yeah. But by the time Ian had come on, I'd obviously been, me and my friend had been drinking all day. So as soon as I seen him, it was I'm like, what do you think of this, Ian? Yeah. Like, showed, <laughs> showed him the bus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of drink involved yeah. in this, isn't yeah. there? <laughs> so um, I showed him the barge. He was like, yeah, that's cool. Chatted for a bit. Yeah. He went off. I went home. Never really heard anything from Ian. So I thought, I'll, I'll just leave it there then. Let him make his own mind up. But then I got a text saying, uh, you know, Keith, can you send me, can you email me the business plan? He's like, yeah. So I emailed him the business plan. And then I got a text back of him saying, yeah, I'm up for this. I want to be proactive and 
I want to be quite heavily involved. So that's how we got Ian. Wow. Basically. So can I uh, just interrupt on that as well? So cool. before Premier, mm. um, you uh, yeah. had another drum company, yeah. which I actually brought along with me, a drum that I brought, brought, by the way, I didn't get it free, <laughs> um, KD Drums. Yeah. Okay, so this was, yeah. uh, what's that, 2005? Yeah, it is uh, 2005. That's a lovely piece of wood, by the way. Serial numbered inside. So that's the Brano. Yeah. So, what I, uh, and the way I used to make drums when I first started out with KD was I would make them out of solid wood in a segmented kind of fashion. Um, what I do now, since joining Premier, and with British Drum Company doing it on the more, this is sort of more cottage industry. What I do now is more on a commercial level. Okay. So it's sort of, you know, plywood, it's just a lot more stable. So, so that's a nice that's drum, a, is it? That's beautiful. That's a beautiful drum, yeah. 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 I can remember you buying this. Yeah, you can yeah. have it off me if you want. I, I'll let you have it for a thousand pounds, that one. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, you know. Nice. So have you, have you learnt much since then? Not on drums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I not. I'll have that back if you don't mind, because okay. I can see you got your eye on it. We're going to lose that. Mm. Yeah. So, how did British Drum Company then come about overall? Well, we had, um, since I asked, we had about six weeks since we started. Well, we, the company was born on the 9th of September, and we launched at the London Drum Show, which was. That was like November? November, mid, mid -November yeah, I think, so about eight, twelve, well, maybe not. Six like weeks two or something. Months or something you had. Yeah, or six weeks, eight weeks. From 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 nothing, we had no hard, no no lugs, no no badges, no just you nothing. A workshop, just, didn't I just remember didn't seeing you. You just had lack no. of so did sleep. You, did you have any concept um, when you were at Premier um, working that? You know, obviously we won't go into the details, but you came to an end with Premier. But had you at the back of your mind gone, I, I want to start my own drum company again? I always, um, I always knew I would come back and do my own company at some point. Um, I think it was Al who gave you some encouragement, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Al Murray. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so Al Murray's uh, the director of British Drums, uh, British Drum Company, and um, when it was kind of, he basically came up to collect a couple of toms, I think, from Premier, and um, there was quite a lot of gossip and stuff going around on all the forums and Facebooks. So well, that's been for 25 yeah. years, to be totally honest, <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah. it? So, so he, he barely just asked me what was, what was going on, so, I told him, um, he took his drums, went away, and then he, he, he called me up and basically said, look, Keith, if you're thinking of doing something, I'd love to be involved with you in, you know, in any kind of shape you want. So um, I had a few other offers. There was a, a few, I can't really go into detail, but I stood back. And the one thing that Al offered me was I, I didn't want to go into being in, in another corporate company. And, uh, and Al seemed very enthusiastic, very supportive. Um, and it, it just gave me the right signals, the right sort of vibe. So that's when I started with Al Murray. And that's when I said, I said to Al, if we're going to do this, I don't want it to be a small custom drum company again. I mean, the British custom drum scene is thriving, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. In my opinion, it's kind of saturated. Mm. So everybody's a custom drum company and you can buy shells and fit your own hardware. So yeah, you're from, making the drums. Yeah, yeah. so f from the beginning, I wanted that. If we were going to do this, we, we have 12 months to sort everything out. We, we, we want our own logs, our own design. We have a set finishes, not, not all these different yeah. wonderful custom finishes, which I'm kind of well known for. Mm -hmm. I wanted a different, I wanted a fresh change, to be honest. Um, so we, had, we only had six weeks, so we had to go with what we had, and we had to kind of make it sort of custom. Or we call it tailored. Yes. We don't call <coughs> it custom, because I, I, again, I, I just hear the word custom jump so much, so I thought, well, let's call it tailored finish. Um, finishes so we've had our 12 months of that in the background we've been designing quite like all our snares we, um, finishes. it's all getting launched yeah, at London yeah, Jump yeah. Show but we've got all our finishes all our um, you mean this the next London Jump Show yeah, 16 yeah. yeah yeah is it 12th 13th November yeah 12th 13th so we're launching all them we've got um, three exciting snare drums I'm probably the most proud of uh, I've ever done uh, we've got two styles of drum kits, really simple. Um, just concentrating on getting uh, our identity, a strong branding. So. Okay. Well, just to finish that off, um, Ian, you're playing in my room at the London Drum Show th this year. So, are you yeah. going to be using any of these new drums? Yes. <laughs> okay. Right, we move on now. <laughs> well, that was a quick answer. So. <laughs> okay, Mikey. <laughs> How are we? Delightful. So, um, 
The gravel tones. Okay. Yeah. I. Good shirt, by the way. It's, Thank you very it's, much. It's looking better. Is it's it sitting on you? Uh, it's sitting. It's wearing you. The guns are wearing you. Are they? The guns are getting in. Okay. So, I mean, what? Six years. The band been around now. Five years. Five okay. years now. Um, yeah. We've actually got a little clip on oh. the show before we ask you any questions. So let's have a look at this clip. I know you're badass. Oh, no, I know you're <laughs> badass. You've seen my ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where was that? So, I think I know where that was. So that's great. Okay. Um, six years. I think you must have been, apart it's from the White five Stripes. Five years. Five years, okay. Five years. Apart yeah. from uh, White Stripes, I don't think there was many duos and certainly doing what, what you were doing. Yeah, no, not really at the time. It was being a duo was something that happened by accident, you know. We had a we the band we formed we were working on Denmark Street. I was in a drum shop, Jimmy was in a guitar shop and this Australian dude came into my shop going, oh, I need a drummer for a gig on Friday. And it was Tuesday. And I was like, yeah, cool, man. I'll do it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm free. And you know, I think at that time I was in four different outfits, like from reggae to pop. And uh, rehearsed on the Thursday, gigged on the Friday. Uh, bass player didn't come to the rehearsal. So we're like, well, let's just do it as a duo. We'll just, do, you know. Um, first gig at the 100 Club, we just... It went down so well that within an, a week we were like, we had regular gigs booked throughout London. So we we're playing four nights a week, like, like that. So we were just like, well, we need to get a bass player, and it never happened. And then it just kind of it grew as this, as a, as a two piece. And we were just like, after six months, we were like, well, should we just stay a two piece? And yeah, it's the way that happened. But, but it's all live as well, isn't it? Yeah, all live, yeah. Yes, no I toyed with the idea of a few yeah, things. No magic tricks going on. And no, 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 no stick spinning. You know, Stop doing that. Yeah. And it's so, <laughs> um, what, is this the second album? What? Yeah, just uh, second album was released earlier this year, yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's been going good. The uh, the Softmore, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> oh. Oh. Horrible, just the whole time. <laughs> You're just in the studio going... Better be good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is actually a lot of pressure. This because I don't know whether it's because everybody builds up that it's meant to be this really hard, nerve-wracking thing that never succeeds. But it uh, is built up, and it, it, it is. Everyone around you is like building it, like yeah. management, record people, mates, anybody. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Everyone's Ooh. like a Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. With their little <laughs> magic fingers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's going good. We we just uh, we finish uh, touring that at the end of this year, um, and then with the third one, uh, we'll just start recording early next year. Oh, you you're ready to start, you know? Oh, we never stop. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. it must be amazing because you know I spoke to the lads from uh, World Blood and they're like, oh, it's great. It's just two of us in a van. We used to just drive up and down the country, just a couple of us, and then then you start getting big time and get a roadie. Yeah, but, a roadie. Know, yeah, yeah. There's three of you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Staying in one hotel. Uh, yeah. So the money must be much better. You know, it's a lot. It's a, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't have to work. Um, so, yeah. so I mean, what's the disadvantages and the advantages of being just the two of you? Um, advantages are, oh, I guess, sometimes usually the songwriting process can be a lot quicker. Sometimes it's like. Well, there's a great song, but you know, for us to pull that off, we'd need this and that, and then, which is cool because it gets your mind. It takes your mind from just keeping everything quite simple sometimes to how can I develop a song that doesn't have bass or keyboards into something that's three-dimensional with just two people. So it's cool in that way. It keeps keeps it quite creative. Um, I suppose the only downside is is that extra third person, third set of ears. Another some more stories, you know, yeah. sitting in that van yeah, for eight hours at a time, yeah. like yeah. like a married yeah. couple. Yeah. You just yeah, you have all the same stories. You just give them numbers. Yeah, yeah. Just, do you remember number eight? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you not got to that stage yet where you just go, you know what? We know each other well enough. We don't need to talk anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> just sit there and get no. on. With it, you know? No, we have a very good. We we have a we have a good laugh still. So you we, do know you could just hire people just to sit and talk to you. Yeah, they might. You know. 
What are I mean, you that's, doing? That's, what are you doing in Norwich? Sabian are doing now. They just, you know, <laughs> they don't want to talk to each other. They just they bring the Leicester City Football Club. Yeah, yeah. Now. That's the, uh, that's I'm up for hire forward. too. If you ever want to spare <laughs> time, yeah. yeah. So how long have you? Because you came from Australia. Mm. How long have you been here? Uh, six and a half years. Because don't wrong. I know Mike thinks that because I'm being Australian that we came for him, which obviously is yeah. true. <laughs> Oh, Whatever. A, you're a magnet. <laughs> so what was the reason for you to to do the basically commute to the other side of the world? Yeah, <laughs> it's a big one. It was yeah. Mike mainly, yeah. She definitely <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh no I, look I had a Australia was very good I had a very comfortable I, I taught a lot. So I, I had a good school, like I taught fifty 50 plus students a week at home. I was very big in, into education and I loved it. Uh, I had lots of gigs coming in every week. So I, it was a comfortable living and it just got to the point where I was like, I was 26 and I was like, this is, can't be it. Like I need, I need, it feels like that it's gonna be really hard for me to keep going up and finding the next challenge. So uh, moving to a big city was kind of like the thing. and. Yeah, I, I decided that if I could come somewhere and and, and do it and and not play, you know, not this wrong wrong with playing weddings or anything like that, but I wanted to create music and kind of create something original, really, and see if I could do it. So, which drum shop did you work in, by the way? Oh, I was in Rose Morris. In Rose Morris. Yeah, so yeah, fun. that was interesting. Yeah, that's for the good fun that was. Yeah. <laughs> okay, your talking point. Oh yes. Um. So this. Talking point basically um, it's about the music industry and the music styles and everything that we're hearing nowadays. Do you do you think that music in general has lost its cultural significance compared to say 20, 30 years ago? I open it up to all of you. Who would like to attempt to answer that first? <coughs> well, having children, mm. I've got two daughters, and they're always listening to music. I know. <laughs> 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 That's why I go to the gym. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the gun. So, polish the guns as the guys Only when the boys come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so they're always on their, you know, on their headphones, listening to music all the time. It's, you know, it's whether, as a, as a, a grown-up, listening to the, that generation's music, like when we were growing up, and any generation, really, mm. <clears throat> since the 50s, maybe, it's always been presumably designed to grate with the parents of the generation afterwards. So in that <laughs> sense, it's not failing, it, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the bee was coming. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe not. Uh, you know, there's... The, the record industry generally is in, in flux, obviously, as we know, because of, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> situation with the internet and... and um, you know, the MP3s and just the way that people people can see music's changed and, and it really has upset the You see the that cart. every week there's just basically a new number one, like songs coming in and out. So True, and else. number ones mm. can be number ones now with yeah. like 7,000 records sold and stuff like that. It's yeah. not the same. Online streaming's now counted. You know, you sold 20 million records in the 80s and you could still be dropped. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's kind of like things have changed, but, you know, me and Mikey are still here. We're making, <laughs> you know, which, which, yeah, culturally, culturally, trying to make a mess of everything. Yeah, gravitational. Yeah, I think it is very fresh at the moment. I think. I think. I mean, I mean forget the sales hmm. and everything else, but it's definitely in a good place. And it's you know, there's, there's, I'm getting a feeling that bands are coming back in. Oh, obviously, yeah. we've got the Blossoms yeah. who are kind of making, uh, you know, ripples in the in you know generally. You know, the, yeah, I think things are cyclical anyway, aren't they? You know, and the pop music industry will always be there. Mm. You know. Um, and it has always been there, so I don't know. Throw yeah, it no, you, totally. Mikey. Like, um, there is a there's obviously a shift. You know, it had to happen with everything going so digital, and it, it kind of it got out of control there. You know, like with people downloading music, you know, without paying for it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think th there's there's a hub, and I think that it's kind of cool because you know you still got the rock and roll kids that, you know, like you remember the rock and roll kids from school that were always like, they're different. Mm -hmm. and, and that still happens, which is great, you know, and, but, you know, obviously pop has got, a, got his hand on things. It's just, I think it's different. It's broken off. Rock and roll's not the pop anymore. And you've got like electronic 
people, you got rock, you got folk, and, and people really kind of like have purified into those the areas, I think, uh, if that makes sense, mm. I think. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's healthy. I think live shows are more of a thing than they ever have been yeah, for, which is, you know, for bands, it's a lot of their income now is to get out there and to just perform because that's where, you know, they're making their money up from, from streaming and things like that. So That's what they're saying, aren't they? They're saying you, you used to make a record you know, and have to do a few dates to promote the record. Now you make a record to promote the tour. Mm -hmm. It's all yeah. one yes. sort of <coughs> event. Yeah. I mean, do you, uh, you know, because you're working 27 hours a day in, in making drums, I mean, mm. do you uh, get a chance to go out and listen to music and... Uh, I don't, I need to. I need to go and listen more so often, you're to still, local you're, bands. You do know the Beatles are split up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, okay, what? Know. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> they've split. Okay. Okay, I'm going to need a minute. <laughs> Um, okay, well, we've come to this section, show and tell, okay? Now, I don't know if they did this uh, in Australia, did they? But uh, in, in England, we used to, uh, um, if you were a certain age, you used to have school, you used to have to bring something in. Oh, we school. had it, yeah. You People would bring... I hated it. Yeah. Did you? I hated standing in the well, class well. and having to show something. Pet snake, whatever. Yeah, you just bring it in kangaroo. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's, Ian, what have you got for your show and tell? Well, I've had to come on the train from Bristol, so I thought I'd bring something a little bit portable. What, like the train? <laughs> 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 so, um, and um, I got quite a few things, obviously, that I could pick from. Uh, Thomas Lang bought his first snare book in Dini not too long ago and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, But I thought I'd bring this, because, um, this is uh, Buddy Rich yeah. at Ronnie Scott's from oh, 1980. Yeah, this book, sorry, this um, record was bought for me by my parents, I think for my 10th birthday. I've been playing drums for a while before that, but this record, I wore it out. And there's like flat areas on, the, on it. Really? Just over and over again. We didn't have, I didn't have many records anyway as a kid, so this was kind of the thing. And um, I would say this probably helped to, to shape the way I hear it anyway when I'm playing, the way I play drums. Yeah. I don't know if this is, because obviously you've got, um, like other his, other his records are more yeah. sort of bigger, wider known and stuff. But this, yeah. this is, you know, there's, there's a tune on here called Time Being, yeah. which is, is incredible, 13 minutes. And it's not just Buddy Rich, it's his band as well. You know, the way, the way they perform it, the way they pull it off is incredible. But that's just one part of the story, really, because um, the year before he died, I think it was in 87, so in 1986 he did a European tour. Yeah. And I was, I was lucky, there. I was, I was lucky, on that. I went as yeah. well. I was lucky enough to be taken to this at the Bristol Colson Hall. So I'd have been 15, maybe, yeah, 15, maybe 14. And I watched the whole show. I watched an old man come on stage. You didn't fall asleep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this was like audible speed. <laughs> good. And um, yeah, an old man came up on stage, told some vaudeville jokes through the mic, got everyone laughing a little bit, and got behind a drum kit. Eventually, you know, hobbled, sat there, and turned into a adolescent teenager yeah. for an hour and a half, which was incredible. And then afterwards, um, I went backstage with my dad. And queued up, and then on this page, yeah, brilliant. I've got his. I don't know if you can see that. There he is. Yeah, I got his autograph. Brilliant. And if, yes. ever since the day I got home from that that show, I've kept this in that sleeve forever. So that's my excellent thing. Wow. Well done. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Keith. Beat that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't beat that. Well, so what I brought in is like I was saying before. Um, we've basically tooled up, so this is a, a premiere for these lugs. This is the first I've ever, anyone's ever seen oh, no these. Seen these I, today is the first Ooh. time Ian's seen them, oh, apart wow. from yeah, Cat in the Flesh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I've wanted something like this for 15 years, longer since I started building drum. It's like a dream for any custom guy to have his own cast lug, because yeah. uh, it gives you a strong identity that nobody can copy. Um, mm. so as, and that's what we've been doing the last 12 months. So it's very hard decor. It's very, um, could be completely wrong because you're the uh, connoisseur here. That reminds me of the, the, the old Ludwigs. Well, these are, what we do is we've got all the classic lugs. Yeah. Um, from Ludwig to Beverly <laughs> to Premier, Slingerland. And they're all from a certain time, like 20s, 30s. 
and we wanted to go with that theme. Um, and because everybody plays, you know, the classic kind of drums, Ludwig's and stuff. It's like Fender will never change the, the Stratocaster. They'll never change that style because why, why would you? Yeah, Hendrix yeah, played it. He influences the next generation. We influence the next generation. It just keeps going to back in a big circle to, to that classic design. So that's kind of why we wanted to, to do these Art Deco looks. I mean, my wife has been tormented for like the last nine years with me talking about Art Deco looks. So I can't, that, you know, that, that means so much to me to finally get that. Good. Well, thank you for Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, we call them Palladium. Yeah, we call them I was going to say, I oh, feel cool. like it's like uh, an old theatre that you walk yeah. into in London. Like a war light. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's what I cinema. see, feel. But we I got, um, it's funny because when you was, we also, we ended up getting a mood board. Alan Kitchen actually is our engineer, who's also part of the British Drum Company. He actually drew all these up. We presented us all with a mood board of all, everything from like the 20s to 30s, what was like but we were doing like door like, handles yeah, and, and like hoods oh, off well. cars and stuff. Like, mi mi and like kitchen mixing machines and, and yeah. sewing machines and anything which they can sew that time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. then we, we kind of just mixed everything up together. Uh, and created that. that, that. Created that yeah, yeah. Cool. Very good. All yeah. right. Looking forward to that. Cheers. Okay. It's the beard. <laughs> is this what well, usually I pull things out of my beard, but uh, what have I got? Didn't you have oh, a YouTube channel doing that? I did have a, yeah. You can, if you look at what's in the beard today, then uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll uh, get... You did that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's about 10 episodes, I yeah, think, it's yeah. When, the, it to be honest, took off. the one that impressed me the most is when you pulled the bus out. Yeah, that was impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red, yeah. Big, big red with with 30 bus. school children on it. Yeah, yeah it was I weird. That was anyway, hard sorry, to get that. Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't it. So I was going to bring, and I, you know, I was going to bring a drum, but I just thought talking about drums is what I do most of the time. So I talk about something different. Okay. And something that you know looks interesting. Yeah. Um, this is his name's Theo. Okay. And he's he's called Porco Theo, which if you speak Italian, you you'll get the joke. Um, he was a purchase on tour because uh, we, we have our own bus. We, we, we decided that we'd buy our, our own tour bus because hiring him is so expensive. Um, and uh, it gets quite stressful because we share the driving. So here's our stress ball mm. for right. uh, when we're driving. Whoever's in the driver's seat, he is always there. So when you have, you know, whether, you know, if you're in a country with exceptionally bad drivers, yep. which we all know the ones. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you can just pick him up and go, and everything just fades away. Wow. For some reason, this soft little, <sighs> you know, it just, it just really helps. Have you done a tour without him? Uh, never, no, not anymore, no. So he, he you he's know, he's got, he's he's got wine speak. stains like coming out of his mouth and he looks, he's, he's He's, he's been he's been worked. Yeah. That's so uh, Theo is uh, you know, saved us really. Saved me a many of times. Has he come back with any bad habits? Oh Tazzy. <laughs> <laughs> and the ones that he's taught us. I don't eat I don't use forks and knives anymore, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we're over to uh, Yes, let's move on. Um, to we don't want to hear about the bad habits of that pig. I think these, <laughs> no. I think these guys can hang out, actually. Yeah, yeah. Let's get that. So while Brent's getting acquainted with uh, Theo, let's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or Stop. Theo's getting acquainted with... <laughs> uh, Brent, what do you have for us today? Hey, Mike and Jill, it's good to see you guys again. I know you guys are thousands of miles away from here, but we're doing another hardware makeover today, and it's for a drummer named Joshua Berrios. He has a very unique setup. I dig it. I think you're going to dig it too. So let's get started. This has to be probably one of the more unique setups that I've seen recently, which is why I chose this one. He's actually using a Gibraltar rack which is a three-sided rack, but the front part of the rack is actually a, a V-bar. Now on the left side, he's got his 12 and 13 inch snare. So the 12 inch snare is below, and the 13 inch snare is above. And these are both mounted to the rack. Now directly next to the 12 inch snare, which is on the bottom, is the 10 inch rack tom. Now the 10 inch rack tom is mounted about two inches higher than the snare, so he can play everything on the same plane. He doesn't have to lift his hand up much. And this is splitting 
the space in between the 14 and the 12. Now, just above the, the, the 10-inch tom, we have his LP toys, which is the jam block, and the mountable tambourine. His left main crash, and that is overshadowing our splash stacker. And then right in front, he has his hi-hats mounted. He's using a remote hi-hat, and he's got his hi-hat placed right where most people place their rack tom, which is very cool because you don't have to worry about getting your hands crossed up and getting fouled up and sticks hitting each other. This is a very cool placement. So he's got his ride cymbal mounted directly over the bass drum, which is in a really perfect playing position. And it's mounted to its own stand that's also connected to the rack. Now he's got his right main crash, his right secondary crash, and his china on the far right. Now for his toms, he's got his 12 and 13 mounted like floor toms, which is awesome. The 12 inch tom is utilizing its own stand because he needs to place that as close to his main snare as possible. If you look, they're almost touching, literally. So he, li he only has to move his, his flip his wrist over about six inches. It's, it's brilliant, I love it, it's brilliant. So right next to the 12, he's got his 13 inch placed. So here it is, I done did it. Joshua, what do you think, man? Is it all right if I call you Josh? I feel like we're on the same wavelength now. Okay, I'll call you Joshua. So Joshua's setup has a number of different levels with drums and with cymbals intermixed. And sometimes with a rack, it's difficult to mount everything to one bar and put them on completely different levels easily. So we're keeping everything on a rack. We're doing two side racks, but we're making it two tiered. So I've got two legs on each foot, two legs in the front, two legs in the back. Now, what I did was I took 20 inch bars for the, for the upper tier, which is the outside, and I took a 20 inch bar and cut it in half and I got two 10 inch bars for the lower tier on the inside. So this gives me that stair step type of look. The outside, I'm using a 46 inch curve bar for the upper tier and on the inside, I'm using a 40 inch curve bar for the upper tier. Same thing for both sides. Now, let's start with the 12 inch. I got the 12 inch with a snare basket mounted directly to the bottom tier. The 13 inch snare drum <clears throat> just made sense to put on the upper tier. Now the 10 inch tom, it, this one made sense too to mount off the bottom tier. So now let's go up to the percussion toys. I've got them separated mount, using their own mounts. I didn't have to do that. I just wanted to do that because I'm quirky like that. Joshua's got his mounted to one rod. So I, what I did was I took a cymbal, a cymbal down tube with a tilter and I mounted an L-arm in there and I used that for both, both the jam block and the mountable tambourine. Then we have our left main crash which is mounted to the top tier of the crossbar. And then our splash stacker is actually mounted out of the front leg of the top tier. So I used an RBA to, to cap right over the end of the 20 inch bar. The front leg of the bottom tier, I'm using to mount my X hat. Yes, I know. You're calling me out right now because I don't have a remote hi-hat stand up here. But what can I do? We don't have a remote hi-hat stand, but we're working on one. So just bear with me on this. So I'm using an X hat. This is the SC4425 XHMB. Just imagine a cable coming from here. Next, we have our right side. Our right cymbal is mounted over the bass drum directly out of the front short leg. Then I've got my right main crash mounted directly out of the back upper tier leg. And then my secondary right crash and my china are both mounted to the top back tier. Now I've got my two rack toms. I've got those mounted on the inside rack because I need them to be low. Now if you notice, on the left side, I mounted the lower tier rack bar on the inside of the legs. On the right side, I mounted the lower tier rack bar on the outside of the leg. I needed to get this 12 inch tom as close as I could to my main snare. So this made me get that extra inch and a half that I was grasping for. Now I've got the 13 mounted directly to the lower tier, which finishes out the kit. So what's really cool about this is that I still have tons of space where I can add more drums, more cymbals, and more accessories. I've got a part of the space left on my top tier and bottom tier on the left and right sides. So here are the product highlights for this month's hardware makeover. We have the Quick Release T-Leg Assembly, the SC GCS QC LT LA. It's a long run, I know. We have the SC GPR20, which is a 20 inch bar. We have the SC GPR46C, which is a 46 inch curve. We have a SC GPR40C, which is a 40 inch curve. And we have the SC GCRQT, which is the quick release T-clamp that allows us to add that extra leg on each of, the, each of the T legs. And we have a right angle clamp, which is the SC GCRA, which is what we're connecting all the crossbars to the verticals with. 
And then we also have the SC4425XHMB, which is our um, makeshift remote hi-hat stand, which is actually our X-hat. Well, that's this week's Brent Hang for you guys. We'll see you next time. Okay, thank you for that, Brent. Uh, right now we're gonna go into one minute with, which for, depending on who you are, can be quite stressful. I uh, got a minute to answer as many questions as you can. I've I hope. got a floppy mic here. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's how it worked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that, that's what you're prepared for. So, um, I'm not saying anything about it. <laughs> I'm um, so let's go to the first one. Okay. All right, this is the first minute with four show this show. Uh, Ian, are you ready? No, I'm going to be awful. Are you? <laughs> Don't be, no, positive thoughts, positive thoughts. <clears throat> All right, and. Your favourite record, recorded performance that you played on? Live at Brixton. Uh, the drummer you first saw that made you want to start? Well, uh, I don't know, somebody off the old Grey Whistle Test in about 1974. Uh, what other hobbies do you have apart from drumming? I like mountain biking. Uh, favourite live venue you've played at? Sorry? Favourite favorite live venue? Uh, 100 Club. First record you ever bought? Uh, live After Death by Iron Maiden. Oh, last record you ever bought? Live After Death by Iron Maiden. <laughs> Your fa <laughs> If dead or alive, which artist would you like to have worked with? Mozart. Ooh, favourite uh, flight or two of us? Flight or two of us? My, my favourite? Flight or two of us? Coming back from Australia to Singapore with Jet in the business <laughs> class, getting smashed at Singapore Airport on, uh, on these little uh, tequila and tomato juice <laughs> things. Uh, your favourite book? Uh, my favourite book? God, why can't I think? <laughs> uh, feel the fear and do it anyway. And that's your one minute. Okay. That was it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what other hobbies do you have apart from drum making? Uh, painting. Uh, the favourite live venue you've been at? Um, probably Glastonbury. First record you ever bought? Uh, Bros. Drop the boy. <laughs> <laughs> Last wow. record you ever bought. <laughs> <laughs> What? The last record you ever bought? Oh, Kasabian, actually. Oh, okay. Kasabian, yeah. Um, favourite all-time movie? Uh, Stand By Me. Favourite holiday vacation? <sighs> Mexico. Um, an artist, dead or alive, which one would you like to meet? Uh, probably Dave Grohl. What is your favourite drum item? Um, my favourite drum item? I've got a Slingerland Radio King snare drum from the 30s. Uh, if you weren't making drums, what would you be doing? Probably a painter. What are you currently listening to on your iPod or CD player or whatever you want to call it? Um, the Beatles. Um, how do you, do you do anything uh, exercise-wise, if you had a choice? No, I should do. <laughs> um, what's important to you uh, as a drum maker? Um, quality, uh, design, innovation, um, and attention to detail. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Hi. Hi. What's up? Final one minute with, are you ready? No. It's all right, it's all right. Okay, okay. First question. Okay. Buddy or Ringo? Buddy. Beer or wine? Wine. How old were you when you started? 12. Uh, what's your favorite type of food? Oh, Japanese. What was the first drum kit you ever owned? Uh, it was a Sonic Drive. Do you play any other instruments? Guitar. Uh, favorite all-time alba album? Album? Uh, uh, Nick Cave, uh, Push the Skies Away. Uh, is there a new drummer you've just gotten into? New drummer, Ian Matthews. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's your life ethos? <laughs> life ethos, play them like they're trying to kill you. Uh, what's important to you as an artist in one word? Uh, integrity. Uh, coated or clear tom heads? Oh, clear. And what are you currently listening to on your iPod? iPod is more Nick Cave. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't a musician, what would you do? Um, I'd be a geologist. Favourite holiday vacation? Um, Italy. Flight or tour bus? Oh, bus, always. Uh, uh, if an artist was dead or alive, who would you like to have worked with? Uh, Hendrix. Uh, Favourite movie of all time? Um, Midnight in Paris. And that's your one minute win. Ooh. Ooh. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. How do they do? They did all right. Did they? Yeah. Have we got any winners on the table? On the I floor? Mean, think there's some run for ah, the leader's money, maybe. Ooh. Okay. Um, I want to ask you a question, Ian. Uh, we've got a little video clip of, of Glastonbury. I think it mm -hmm. was 14. Glastonbury. Mm -hmm. Glastonbury. So that's what it's called, isn't it? 
Good. Glastonbury, mate. Oh, yeah, I was kidding. Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> Brew. It's cheese, not... Um, how was that? That was great. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was amazing, actually. Um, it was kind of surreal because when you do those kind of gigs, we spent so long leading up to that because it was, you know, many years into our touring. I remember the... Because I'm from Bristol, so I've been playing Glastonbury. There it is, Glastonbury. Glastonbury. <laughs> Glastonbury. <laughs> um, <laughs> since, I, since about 94. Okay. Since 94. Wow. Because uh, I was in, you know, like you were saying, you know, multiple projects. Yeah. You know, and a lot of the small stages in Glastonbury, because it's a huge site, and you know, um, is run by a lot of local promoters or bars and stuff. So I used to do anything like two, three, four gigs a weekend in Glastonbury almost, almost every year. Wow. So I would get in there somehow. I mean, the smallest gig we did was uh, two in the morning in the Hunt Saboteurs tent up in the green fields. And got this oik the drum kit across the muddy flats and up the hill with this little band. And we had a tiny little stage about the size of that table. And um, there was Hunt Saboteur videos, anti Hunt playing. And there was, there was a lady with a babe in arms, you know, <laughs> and cuddling and, and a few other people, bells of hay. There was a river running through the middle because it was on the hill. Of mud, and then um, the whole light, the whole electric situation, like the lights and the <coughs> PA, was driven by uh, a girl in a Baker foil mini dress, sat on a bike, no, and really she was pedalling away. Really, <coughs> faster she pedalled, yeah, the louder yeah. we were. So I've I've gone through this the whole uh, evolution of Glastonbury, you know, <coughs> and then the, I remember with the saving thing, we've been going, you know, and then the management, you know, so, well, I think it was two thousand five, I think it was said right I oh, know we did yeah we did 2004 on the other stage and then we did 2005 and then I think it was 07 then possibly um we got the offer to support if you like penultimate then on a Friday night before the Arctic Monkeys on the main stage right. I sat in front of that pyramid stage for donkeys of years going and as each year clocked by it's like nah no, I'm never gonna nah, mm. nah you know what I mean it's just one of those things a pipe dream and if I just iconised it in my head. So the coach trip from, from Bristol that day to Glastonbury, I came out in hives. I felt the warmth oh, of, of pure nerves, wow. <laughs> which I don't usually get, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like... That's so amazing. queuing forward to 2014, we've done it a few times, a few penalty snots by yeah. then. This was our headliner. You would expect, you know, for that to happen again, but it wasn't. In fact, if anything, I felt really focused. It was when I got off the kit at the end of the show and I went to the front of the stage to do the kind of like thank you, wave goodbye to everyone and we're all at the front of the stage doing the whole last lap, victory lap, yeah. if you like. And I felt melancholic then because right. I realised it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's done. It's done. It's done. But also, yeah. when would we play it again? When yeah. would we play Glastonbury? When would I, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I felt a little tinge of sadness coming off oh, the yeah. stage, if, if anything. Yeah. But it was mind-blowingly beautiful and, it, and I really... It only really hit me about an hour later. Well, let's just uh, yeah. take a look at this video, okay?
So maybe what you should do now is you should go back to the beginning mm. and get Kasabian <laughs> and that poor girl on yeah. the bike, cycling, cycling and yeah. start again. Thunder yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you want to, next time you go, I'm sure you can take the pig. Yeah, okay. yeah, Paul you, oh, Mikey yeah. has to come with me. Well, yeah, of course, of course. Take a seat. You got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, now we've come to uh, the towards the end of the show, but I've got a little. Uh, this is use it or lose it, ah. and um, we're quite fortunate um, because uh, Ian um, and Keith don't really know that I've got this, um, but well, I've got this. There we go. This oh. little item <laughs> here, <laughs> called the eye tap. Okay, which um, you can't really decide whether you'd use it or not because you designed it. Yeah. But there you good, go. good man. So, so it's up to me. Think? What do you yeah. like? And uh, well, just gonna, don't worry, it's coming towards the end of the show. So, so I can, I can <laughs> open the like it now. You can you can well. say whatever you want and run out the door. That's would that's you fine. like some information on it? Yeah, oh, hit me. Please. Let's uh, let's so, go. Where's the on button? So. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, it's uh, smaller than a typical cajon at A4 paper size and no it's shit. only A4 paper. <laughs> 12 millimetres thick and is small and easy to carry around instrument packs. Of I'm just reading what I think. I know, it's a lot smaller than a cajon. Um, it's no more overpowering percussion when jamming in acoustic sessions. It produces just the right level of volume and sensitivity. Yeah. And it can accommodate a clip mic for bigger venues if needed. Mm. Well they make it very done, clear, sir. by the way. Well done, sir. <laughs> I, I noticed I like to point out that it makes it very clear on here that it is not a practice pad. It is not oh, a practice yeah. pad. So Can you if use anyone asks, it? it's not a practice pad. I use bushes on it. You use sticks on it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've used some little jazz sticks and yeah. tip about one. Okay. You know, obviously not going to throttle it because yeah. you go through it. But Can it's, you it's use Thomas nice. Lane sticks on it? Oof. No, I wouldn't recommend. Can anybody okay. use Thomas <laughs> Lane sticks? <laughs> period. <laughs> Besides Thomas Lane. There we go. Oh, no, it's good going. Got, Ooh, it's got it's a wide range of sounds. It's though. got mm. some sounds, and it's teeny tiny. And how much are they selling for? They're twenty nine ninety nine. And for our US visitors, Ooh, dollar five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thirty dollars. So for those. Yeah, are, this yeah. is uh, like for me. Um, I play loud. I'm a loud man. My my band is always loud. Yeah. Um, but every now and then we have in stores, and I'm always like. Ugh. I couldn't be bothered buying a cajon, but for 30 quid I would, yeah. definitely. Because um, you put a, the idea, you get a kick drum mic on that and you're going to get all the low ends, aren't you? It was designed to um, torment all the girlfriends and wives of the industry. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, every drummer, <laughs> is, he is the first. That's a bit Stop sexist. Topping. Hang on though, what about the girls and their... The girl drummers out there that you know you mean the husbands and boyfriends oh, but i don't know if the husband would say to the girl stop tapping no, that's very true we'll put that one out there as a competition yeah. prize yeah, you, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you can win that if we know the answer to yeah. that <laughs> i think it's really good actually no, I it like it. looks great and and now you said that i could really i could actually put one in my car and really annoy my kids mm -hmm. yeah. just drop it to the steering wheel yeah in fact i could have a few and really go for it, couldn't you? I think you could really annoy him. Yeah. I'll use it as a mouse mat as well. Does he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll play it on the computer, yeah. I'd like to hear it, um, like, sat, like, sat on a snare with a, with a mallet. They've got a snare down here. Well, well, here's one we... Yeah. Well, OK, well, well, while, they are, uh, while they're presenting uh, their performance, uh, we're, we're going to say goodbye. <laughs> uh, what? And uh, Keith's going to play us out. Yeah. Keith, uh, his new... Uh, oh, it doesn't fit. Does it, he's, oh, <laughs> he's the 14. Sorry, Keith may be the wrong size snare drum. That's the problem. There we go. OK. Oh, there we go, yeah. So anyway, thank you very hey. much. And this is the end of show 11. And uh, we will see you for one more show. Yeah, one more show. We've got one more show. So thank you very much. And over to you. you.